Welcome to Aspen Affairs. I'm Allison Bektesh, Public Affairs Manager with the Aspen Chamber Resort Association. I'm pleased to have as my guest today, Dan Bartholomew, Director of the Aspen Picking County Airport, and Jacqueline Francis, Chair of the Airport Advisory Board. Many viewers are likely somewhat aware that community discussions regarding the airport's future have been ongoing. Today, I'd like to break those conversations down into layman's terms and learn more about the planning process. Of course, we can't talk about the future without learning from the past and getting a good assessment of current airport conditions. We're going to get to all of that on today's show. Stay with us. Dan and Jackie, thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to start with brief introductions so people know who you are and then get through a lot of questions. Dan, let's start with you. What does the director of an airport do? Well, I was kind of hoping you could tell me, Allison. <laughs> you know, um, so airport directors really oversee the day-to-day -day management of an airport facility, also ensuring that we maintain compliance with federal regulations, safety, uh, and then local regulations as well, and ensure a good customer experience. All right. And how long have you been in this role? Two and a half years. Okay. And Jackie, tell me more about the role of the chair of the Airport Advisory Board. This is a citizen board that was appointed by the Pickens County Commissioners. Yes, as the chair of the board, I work with uh, Dan and the staff and uh, the community liaison for the Pickens County Board of County Commissioners to do the agenda setting. And then when it comes to our monthly meetings, which are the third Thursday of every month from 3 to 5 p.m., I run the meetings and... Um, you know, that's pretty much that's pretty much my role I mean mm -hmm. I, I do have community like liaison responsibilities when it comes to presenting at the BOCC or speaking with community members about what they see us doing in the process and how to make sure I'm listening to the community when it comes to the airport we're gonna get into some of the history later but it's rare for an airport to have an advisory board where the community members get to weigh in is this something special to ASE you know a lot of airports will have citizens or community advisory boards of some sort for an airport. Um, this one is a little more integrated, uh, I'd say, into the community's wishes and desires for how the airport of the future, this airport's future, um, unfold. Wonderful. This is a fairly new uh, Picking County board uh, that was just seated like a year and a half ago, two years ago, something mm -hmm. like that. So it, it hasn't existed for a long, long period of time, although I have been involved in uh, volunteer committees throughout the years, and the the airport board is, is fairly new. Wonderful. Okay, one last clarifying question before we get into the discussion. Can you explain the relationship between the Federal Aviation Administration, what its role and overs oversights are for um, funding individual airports, and um, if there's anything in particular between the FAA and our local air airport ASC? Mm -hmm. So. The the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, oversees almost all aspects of how an airport is operated. Their main focus is to ensure that an airport is operated in a safe and efficient manner, but then to also ensure that it is open to anybody, uh, because it is a public facility, anybody that has a desire to use that facility in accordance with federal regulations. Um, <clears throat> they are also the, we are the sponsor of the airport as the county that the FAA oversees many aspects of running an airport. They oversee safety. We administer safety as far as we oversee it, but they provide the regulations for what is safe, what is efficient, um, how an airport needs to operate, and we operate it within those guidelines. The FAA also provides funding for the airport, which is a big part of the FAA's role in an airport because they are requiring you to operate a public facility that is composed of interstate and international transportation, they provide grant funding to public use airport facilities to ensure safety, security, and an operational facility. What is the ASE-FAA relationship right now? Do we have some um, kind of old integrated agreements that are going on? So we are beholden to what are called grant assurance agreements. So it's part of receiving grant funding from the FAA or the federal government there are certain things that our county board as our airport sponsor signs to say we accept that money in agreement that we will do certain things that the FAA wants us to do. Um, that is, every airport does that, uh, that in the United States, that is a public use airport. Um, so, but our relationship with the FAA is good, it's better. It, at, there was one time when it wasn't as good. We've worked very hard 
uh, to reestablish a good relationship, and we work closely with the FAA um, to present the community's goals, community's desires, and compare them to what FAA guidelines and regulations are. And we try to find a happy medium there if we can. Some areas you can, some areas you can't. Okay. Um, a term we're going to hit on mm -hmm. often throughout this conversation is, an, is the airport layout plan. Sure. What is the purpose of an FAA-approved airport layout plan, mm -hmm. ALP? So essentially an airport layout plan or ALP is a planning guiding document for an airport. It'll show existing conditions and proposed future conditions of an airfield. And the way the FAA gets involved in that is they want to ensure that the existing conditions and future conditions meet regulatory guidance, whether it's um, guidance as far as safety areas, um, make sure there's not obstructions in certain areas, um, make sure it meets federal guidelines for a vast array of things. But it also is a precursor then, once an ALP is approved, it is conditionally approved which means after it is approved, it needs to go through an environmental process for certain projects. Again, we're talking about a federally obligated facility, the EPA and NEPA apply. So it goes through that process, and then it goes through a funding process. Is there grant funding from the federal government available and prioritized for your facility? And it's all based on that airport layout plan. Okay, so we are operating under one now. Yeah. It was approved mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. My understanding is this plan has elements that are at odds with some community sentiment and values, mm -hmm. and so this is where the ASE visioning process came in. Um, Jackie, can you give us a little bit of the history of that visioning process from the 2016 ALP that we are currently operating under? Yes. <clears throat> so my understanding in 2016 is there was some push pushback from the community about the 2016 approved ALP, and uh, certain elements wanted to be like revisited. And so the, the Board of County Commissioners reached out into the community and put out an open ask for people to be a part of these committees that they were putting together to uh, um, get their input, the community input on the, um, the airport. And five committees were um, seated. It was something like 160 people in the community that applied for these positions. Uh, the BOCC chose to include everybody who wanted to be involved rather than just picking you know, a small group of people. So they put people on different uh, committees that were looking into different aspects of the airport, whether it be the character of the airport or the transportation um, integration that was happening at the airport. And there was one committee that was kind of the um, oversight committee, the sort of the executive committee, and that was called the uh, visioning committee. And that had three people from the community that were uh, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the navigator. And John Bennett was the pilot, Meg Haynes was the co-pilot, and I was the navigator. And these are all three people that have been in the community forever. I'm a 50-year local. I um, raised my kids across the street from the airport at the North 40, from the beginning of the North 40 neighborhood. Um, I went to elementary school, high school, middle school here, and I have been active and involved and engaged in this community for a long, long time. So this isn't something that was, you know, led by outside consultants. As a matter of fact, John Bennett at one point was like, we don't even want those consultants in the room because we want to, like, lead this. We want to guide this. And we did. And the three of us uh, met for meetings at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week. And the committee, the executive committee from the visioning process, um, stayed intact the entire time. Uh, there was one person who never started because he had a conflict of interest. And from then on, everybody stayed involved and everybody was involved in the final vote. In the final vote, right before COVID, um, there was one person who voted against one resolution in uh, the 15 recommendations that we moved forward to the BOCC, which became codified in Resolution 105-2020 uh, back in, um, I think it was April of 2020. Then COVID hit. Then we moved on through a strange period. But then the um, airport advisory board was seated and Meg Haynes and I are both on there, as well as several other people who were on uh, the executive committee of the visioning process. It's been a very strongly led community process, and um, very many people in the community have been involved. There has been some uh, 
changes due to the changes that have happened in our community in the last few years, but I think the entire process was really well done. And of course, we're going to get to what some of those recommendations were. Since you're touching on it, I want to ask you, I mean, 160 people volunteering their time over years of, for you, weekly meetings. Um, how is the airport, how does it affect the community and vice versa? Why even care what's happening at your local airport? I mean, the airport touches everybody. Whether you come in and out and use it uh, is one thing, but, you know, your your job probably depends on people coming in and out using the airport and if it's not your job then it's maybe your employer's job or your co-workers jobs and you know it's also a place for families to come in and out for the holidays and you know the airport also being the center of our valley it affects everybody through you know the, the noise the impact um, and it, it's not like it's some airport that's far away from us. It's, it's right here in our community. We all use it, we all see it, we all um, experience everything about it. Thank you. So as you said, ultimately, ultimately there were a set of recommendations that came out of that visioning process. So I'm curious, we're operating under the 2016 one. We have now, um, in that uh, proposal that you referenced, um, that was approved in April? It was, I think it was April 2020. Uh, it was codified with, um, it's, it's resolution 105, 2020. Okay. Um, we have this suggestion for a different airport layout plan. What are some of the differences between what is now being discussed in this modernization conversation and what we're operating under in that 2016 plan? You know, I can kind of do a vague reference okay. to it and maybe Dan can jump in with a little more, um, detail, but, uh, it is my understanding that we actually wanted to keep the runway in place and not shift it towards the west side. Uh, we also talked about not quite going as big with the terminal. And, um, you know, then we were, we, we really put a lot of effort into adding things that are going to like in, increase the electric, the electrification capabilities of the airport, increase solar. Um, on all the like patio shelters as well as increase the transportation um, multimodal aspect of the airport within the community in a broader sense and I'm sure there are other things that we could add on to there but it was a much more comprehensive kind of look at what what we could do. Oh I think you have absolutely hit the highlights. Um, the original the ALP that's in current right now does not also look at the the airport has property on the other side of highway 82 as well okay and Joe uh, as Jackie alluded to we're looking at an intermodal facility possibly over there and doing things a little more efficiently in green. So, uh, so for most part, you know, it matches, but there are some aspects, particularly the taxiway shift to the east rather than the runway shift to the west. That's the primary issue. And let me add too, we, we looked at noise as well mm -hmm. and how noise affects the neighborhood, doing some berming, mm -hmm. you know, having buildings that protect from the noise and stuff like that. So we looked at noise, we looked at emissions, a lot of emissions issues and certainly safety. Okay, so we have um, an ALP that we're operating under status quo. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have a deadline or anything. Mm -hmm. And then we have the second one on the books proposed that would, it sounds like, um, greenify things, maybe quiet it down, maybe make some more modernization to our transportation options. Mm -hmm. However, of course, there's community conversation that is in dissent of this conversation mo moving forward. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the concerns you're hearing about um, this whole process that went into the new proposed ALP? What are some of the issues that the community is taking with what you've proposed? One of the things the community is saying is that the people didn't stay engaged, and that's just not true. I mean, the executive, com it, it was a long process. There's a lot of people that didn't stay involved the whole time because their jobs were finished and, you know, they got, like, phased out. But as far as the executive committee, the visioning committee, we stayed, we stayed involved the entire time. And so it's just not true. And another thing that people don't understand really is that this was an aspirational goal but that we looked at all the things that, you know, we thought were practical and possible and would work within the framework of what's, you know, legal with the FAA. And, you know, everything isn't just like magic. You actually have to have things that work within the structure and the system that exists and who's paying for it. So a lot of the, um, the things that the community's talking about now, we, we looked at okay. and we maybe couldn't make it um, fit in a certain way, but um, 
we felt like what we did was thread the needle in, in a very practical and reasonable and responsible way. Dana, there's some specifics of these kind of pipe dreams, um, and I don't mean to, to deride anyone's ideas, no. but um, some of the things you're hearing that sound really good in a letter to the editor, for instance, but that has been looked into and it's mm -hmm. not feasible at, at, at ASE? Well, I think one thing is, is telling the FA we're not going to necessarily do what they want us to do. Uh, unfortunately, they have a carrot uh, in many aspects. Well, two carrots, really. Uh, one being funding, the other one being permission to allow us to do things on the airfield. Again, we're talking about federally obligated property. Um, and with us receiving grants over years and years and years and decades from the FAA, we're beholden to them in many aspects. Um, so we, we need to work with them to get some of this done. Um, the fact that the FAA has told us we're not going to receive any additional grant funding until we get some safety issues, and that's this modification of standard, which they call it, on our ALP, which is the separation of the runway center line to the taxiway center line. It needs to expand by 80 more feet. Okay? Standardization equals safety in, their, in the FAA's world. Um, until we get that addressed, they're telling us we are only going to receive minimal, or called entitlement funding, from the FAA. And to maintain our airfield, to the safety standards that we need to, that minimal amount of money is not enough. We mm. need discretionary funds for some of the issues we are up against now with the airfield. I mean, I have probably endless follow-up questions to that, mm -hmm. um, but one thing that it sounds like is that at some point, mm -hmm. we did kind of skirt or negotiate some standards in one way or the other. Are people mm -hmm. saying, just, just make different handshake deals this time too? Is that what... Is that what we're under right now? To an, to an extent. Um, so the, the FAA has changed uh, their direction over time. Okay. You know, originally, you, you, the old adage in the airport world is you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Um, <laughs> the FAA is trying to standardize things more now. Uh, right now, we are a group, what they call a group three airport with a modification of standard, which means we don't meet a particular standard. We are somewhere in between. And from a safety aspect, the FAA wants us to get to a, a agreed upon firm standard. And that's where they want us to get. And that is now their mission. Um, safety being paramount mission, they want everybody to get to that same. And we're not the only airport being pushed in that direction. Um, uh, all airports are being pushed towards that direction. So I realize we actually aren't during this conversation going to get too far into some of what the future airport might look like. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to just point out that there's many resources on your website because um, you're mentioning things like our runway mm -hmm. and our taxiway are essentially too close mm -hmm. for comfort um, according to the AFA sta safety standards mm -hmm. right now. My assumption is that there's the proposal of what's going to happen to the airport in the future would be to separate those out. Correct. And I just want to say, since we're not getting into all of those details in this mm -hmm. conversation, they are available online on your website. Yes, we do have a community information section on, our, er, on the airport's website. Perfect. And that's the fun part, right? Once we ta start talking about like how to get the Aspen Leaf carpet back in the airport and mm -hmm. what it's going to look like and what food we're going to eat, what cocktails in the terminal, that's all the fun part. This is all, this, all the steps leading up to even dreaming or starting to create some updates to the airport. Mm -hmm. So just putting that out there. Um, and I do want to talk about our menu of options moving forward then. So um, what all the different directions that things could go, but I think it's prudent to talk about what we're dealing with right now sure. to better understand that. And it leads right into um, what you were just speaking about, Dan, mm -hmm. um, with some of the funding we need just for upkeep. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to do like a state of the union of the airport, where are we at right now? We've had seasonal closures for the last couple of years. Again, mm -hmm. that terminal is nothing that anyone's going to brag about. Sure. Um, so what what is the status of our airport? Sure. So there's a couple of things there, a number of things there actually. So one thing we've discovered over the last couple of years is our pavement is aging significantly, um, particularly our runway, but all of our airfield pavement in some fashion is aging. Um, every year it's becoming more and more expensive to maintain that or just to keep it operating but it is a, part of that is because we have to do more work to keep it operating we're having to close for a longer period of time so you go back several years and we close down for a, a week perhaps last year the last couple of years it was two weeks this year we're looking at three weeks and you can expect that to continue and we can expect the cost to escalate on that 
problem with that also is we receive about $2.4 million a year in what they call um, in, in general funding uh, okay. for the, to maintain. That's a federal grant that we get. We will need additional funding because we're spending about $7 million this year to maintain just the runway. We get that $2.4 million. So you can see there's a slight gap there in the funding. <laughs> That's going to have to come from another, something else with airport revenue somewhere. So we need to find out ways to fund these moving forward, and it's going to get worse and worse every year. Um, then we have the terminal. The terminal, we're deferring maintenance items on the terminal. So we have, the, the airport terminal is, is not an energy efficient uh, building uh, in the county. It is an aged facility, it was built in 1976. Uh, we are on boiler heat and things such as that, but we are deferring multi-million dollar investments into that right now because we don't want to put that kind of funding into a facility that we're hoping to replace with a net zero green terminal. And that's our goal moving forward with this. However, the FAA has told us that if we want any funding for that terminal, we need to address the airfield issues first. Okay, and then on top of that, we also have a 30-year agreement with our fixed-based operator, Atlantic Aviation, that just expired. Our board just uh, uh, agreed to extend that for up to 12 months. Um, and there's some discussion that if we take over the FBO, that we will make enough money that we don't have to adhere to FAA regulations and we're not beholden to FAA funding. And that's just not the case. There is no way we're going to make the kind of revenue from a fixed-based operator through fuel sales or other things to pay the hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure needs that this airport's going to need moving forward. On top of a terminal, um, on top of other things that we're going to need. So it's just we have a number of needs right now that are highly funded. And the FAA still has oversight over it. And, and, that's, and that's true. Um, even if we receive zero funding from the FAA. That's literally what I was going to ask. Like, please yep. don't tell me there's airports out there that are just sending airplanes up and down with <laughs> really like, really? Like, no. no oversight from the FAA, right? No, complete oversight from the FAA. Even if we were to pay, let's say, let's say we came back and said, we'll fund the terminal ourselves. We don't need FAA. They still can say, fine. We're not going to allow you to build the terminal. Um, so they still have oversight, both environmental oversight, but then constructability um, and location oversight on the airfield. So it's not just a funding issue. Sure, if we took over the FBO and let's say we did make enough money to do things, the FAA can still say no to certain things. Just as far as like air traffic control mm -hmm. and just being part of the entire, like you said, international system yes. of of air traffic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Jackie, from just, again, the community perspective, um, what are we getting out of our airport right now and what are some of the potential things we could get with all of this stuff integrated? I mean, the airport is a, is a it, it's a big, um, like it influences a lot of things in the community. And I mean, one of the things that we talked about in the visioning process is how do we make the airport less impactful in our community? And I think the community really kind of wants that. And we do have quite a big percentage of the operations coming in from the general aviation side, but we want um, to make sure that we look at how we can improve the commercial side, how we can, com how, how we can really improve the whole experience of getting in and out of the airport, how we can have uh, less emissions and hopefully less noise, and how um, you know newer, more efficient airplanes will have uh, you, you know the impacts of less less emissions and less noise. And I mean, we want to improve not only the experience of going in and out of the airport, but the the experience of everything that the airport brings to the community. And um, that's kind of our whole goal with the airport advisory board, is how do we integrate the, the airport with the community in a way that you know, is less negative for the community, that is, a better, that is a better terminal, a better airfield, and you know, hopefully doesn't um, create this real big problem with more growth because we can manage it somehow. But the airport is not a growth management tool but how we can best um, increase the, the benefits of the experience overall. Okay, so status quo right now is we have the runway um, pavement issues. Mm -hmm. They are continuing to deteriorate. 
um, an inefficient terminal. Mm -hmm. Anything else, kind of just as we as we chug along, that people should know about our current the state of our current airport. Sure. Um, well, there are certain things we cannot do. Also, uh, we would love to electrify our rental car fleet. Hmm. We cannot do that uh, right now because we don't have enough power available at the airport to do that, and we don't want to put that infrastructure in with the you know, the goal of building a new terminal and where exactly is gonna, that going to go and we don't want to put things in that we're going to have to rip out and redo and things such as that. So there's a number of things that we just can't do right now until we make some decisions about where the future of the airport is going to go. We also can't reach some of the goals that the Common Ground recommendations put in. A 30% reduction in emissions, 30% reduction in noise. Without some of these newer, cleaner, quieter aircraft, there's just no way we're going to make those goals, especially by 2030. And then one definition, um, clarification, mm -hmm. commercial versus general aviation. I like to think I'm involved in general aviation, but I'm definitely not, right? Like when we say GA, we actually mean private planes. Typically. Um, and so us generalists mm -hmm. actually go on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. um, and and so what what is what are some misunderstandings about those two t separate um but separate operations that both use the same, obviously, mm -hmm. runway and um, space. Is there anything else um, with, with that partnership right now that sure. people should know? Well, one of the primary mandates of the FAA is a non-discriminatory clause. We cannot discriminate with what type of operator comes in an airport. Um, you know, that would be like telling one person they can use the interstate highway and one person they can't just because of the color of their car. Um, so we cannot do that. Um, so we have no control. That's an FAA issue as far as who can come in and out of an airfield. Um, so any objectives to control that through any process is just um, is a non non-starter. A plane is a plane, mm -hmm. according to the FAA. Okay. <laughs> so in that difference between private and commercial, um, do do the private planes coming in? Do they get first dibs on landing? Um, there's talk if the, if the runway were to change, that maybe we would see nonstop every second private planes, commercial would get booted out. What is that relationship? So as far as do they get priority yeah. over commercial aircraft, absolutely not. Um, that would not be an efficient way to run an airspace system, for one. And we have been told time and time again by our air traffic control uh, and by the FAA headquarters, that that is not an objective of the FAA, that would be discriminatory. Okay. If they started going down the path of prioritizing one over the other. It's basically a first come, first serve basis. Now, if an aircraft is lower on fuel or there's some issue, yeah, they make it priority. But typically, all aircraft are treated equally. And it has to be a first come, first serve basis because if you start holding up an aircraft here, it affects every other aircraft within that system uh, across the nation. There's a ripple effect. So it's absolutely not the case. And I want to add that I've been told by people at United that if they could update their avionics and fly in newer planes, then there are times where they could fly in um, more often, you know, if the weather's bad. Hmm. And, you know, it's, it's also, uh, this is an airline issue as well. I mean, if they have too much weight on a plane and, they ha and nobody wants to get off, they'll sit on the runway and, and burn fuel, which is something we don't want to see happen anymore. And then, of course, there's air traffic issues in other airports like Denver, where Denver will put a hold on them. So people are getting delayed on the commercial side more so than on the private side because of other, you know, other factors and other impacts. And there's this misconception that it's happening here in our airport, and it's not necessarily the case. And this is so fascinating to me, like kind of the gearhead side of this conversation is what airplanes are we flying in and out of Aspen now? Mm -hmm. How long can we fly those? What would be available if we updated mm -hmm. or modernize the airport? Or what's going to be like, what, what are we going to have to use? Because those are the only airplanes that are flying once mm -hmm. everything becomes greener and quieter. Um, so can we talk a little bit about kind of the future of airplanes mm -hmm. um, as it as it relates to this conversation? Yeah, Absolutely. So the current, because we do have this 95-foot wingspan restriction at the airport, the current aircraft that's approved to come in here is the CRJ-700. That's a relatively antiquated aircraft, all things being equal across the spectrum of commercial aircraft. The avionics are older in that aircraft. That's why you will see, a, that's why you get this perception sometimes that private aircraft are being prioritized over commercial aircraft. Because many times the commercial aircraft cannot make it in in days like today where it's inclement weather. Um, the avionics are older, 
and an airline is not going to upgrade avionics in an antiquated aircraft. They're going to look for a replacement aircraft. Uh, and that's a part of why we're doing this airport layout plan. We're getting, a, a, we're trying to develop a facility that can accept uh, not only cleaner, quieter aircraft, but ones with more advanced avionics that will reduce the delays and re-diverts and things like that for the aircraft. Um, so ultimately, it's a business decision from the airlines on whether they keep that aircraft in the long term. Right now, um, the CRJ-700, the Aspen Airport is the only airport that requires the CRJ-700 uh, still to be in the fleet mix. Other airports can all accept a different aircraft, but not the, not the Aspen aircraft. So that's a difficult business decision for an airline to say, we're going to keep one aircraft in our fleet for one airport. That's expensive. So, I mean, it's a little ironic, right? Actually, if we stick under the current ALP, we could become private only if there's literally no commercial you know, aircraft left to serve us, if that's not a business decision that continues. It's always a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like the. I think I think that's the worst case scenario. We'd have an airport that people like you know you and me can't even use because it's a private airport. Right. And and I do want to add that I am a um, a climate scientist and I have an international climate solutions organization. So I try and stay kind of on the cutting ed, uh, edge of what the future of um, airport airplanes, airports, and air fuel looks like as well. And it's it's one of the things I can bring to the board is just what I'm seeing. But I want to make sure people know that we can't um, put something in front of the FAA that doesn't exist yet. We can't okay. say that we want to have all these electric planes when they're not flying yet. So we have to stay within the rules of, like, you know, <laughs> what's, what's currently existing. Okay. While predicting for the future, which I'm going to put on you right now, I understand that's a complicated seat. Um, but as you mentioned, we did get our first snow of the season. We're at the end of the year here. Mm -hmm. um, there is on the calendar of the current ALP that's proposed, um, we're looking at early spring as of right now for maybe a BOCC vote. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about those possible futures. Is it just that either we stick under the 2016 ALP or we adopt a new one this spring? Or is there some sort of negotiating and infinite possibilities that could happen from here? Not necessarily. So our existing ALP is our guiding document right now, according to the FAA. Until that is updated, preferably with what the, the visioning process and the common ground recommendations brought forth, until we update the ALP to show those items, we are beholden to our existing ALP. Now, we, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to move forward with anything, but it also means we are not accepting any funding from the FAA or not eligible to accept any funding for the FAA. So every, all the issues we're dealing with right now aren't going to go away. They're only going to get more expensive and have greater impacts over time. There is some sort of deadline right now that we are not receiving funds, or what, right. what's, what's important about the timing right now? Well, a couple of things with the timing. One, we have aging pavement. We have expensive projects uh, just to maintain the airport. We are not eligible for what they call discretionary funding uh, from the FAA. We, we're, we get entitlements, which is that little $2.4 million. Um, and that's just not enough to maintain the pavement. So from that standpoint, the clock is ticking. Until we address some of the issues the FAA wants us to address, we're not eligible for funding to really um, remediate some of the issues we're going on with our airfield right now. Um, the other issue is, is there's a tremendous, a once in a generational opportunity for funding right now. The bipartisan infrastructure law funding set aside billions for airport terminals and more for inter, uh, um, electrification and intermodal transportation and some other things. And that deadline for those funds is quickly approaching. Okay. And we will likely, if we don't move ahead very quickly here, lose out on that opportunity. And I want to get back a little bit, too, to the idea of, you know, risking that this could become a private airport. Because, I mean, the contract negotiations with Atlantic are moving forward. And that's probably going to be a successful lease negotiation for the next who knows how many years, but in the future. So there'll be um, money for this updated, beautiful, private airport. And then there won't be money for you know, what we need, which is a, an updated commercial side. And there won't be money for the, um, you know, the solar and the electrification projects that we want to have. And there, and there won't be money for, you know, the 
the intermodal transportation piece. And these are all things that I've heard from the community are really important to us. And we'd be giving up on that possible future. We're going to get to a point where all of our revenue is going to go towards maintaining our pavement and nothing else. How can people stay up to date on these conversations as they move forward? Is there a way that they can still mm -hmm. voice their opinion or get involved? Yeah, a couple of ways. Uh, so we have started a, an airport newsletter, um, and we can give you the address for that. Um, we also have the airport advisory board, uh, third, two, third Thursday of every month, and that's an open public meeting. We welcome people to come and supply comments at that meeting. Um, and then just our airport uh, website. We are constantly uh, providing updated information about the projects and the status of various things on that website. And then we plan on having various open houses as we work through this ALP project, but then also a terminal design, some other things as we go forward. The cocktails, that's the fun part. Exactly. Yeah, uh, the, the meetings are at the airport operations building over on the Owl Creek Road side from 3 to 5 on those Thursdays. And we do take public comment at both the beginning and the end of the meetings. You can also zoom in as well. Okay, so we really try to keep an open door to the mm -hmm. community. And we will have links to all of that um, in the notes of this show. I want to give a big thank you to Dan Bartholomew, Director of the Aspen Picking County Airport, and Jacqueline Francis, Chair of the Airport Advisory Board, for joining me today on Aspen Affairs. I'm Allison Bektesh, Public Affairs Manager at ACRA. We do have an airport resource page on our website with links to news coverage, the airport layout plan, the advisory process, and upcoming public meetings. You can find that and other episodes of Aspen Affairs online, aspenchamber.org. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Allison.